All right, so let's start with these textures. Um, the biggest thing to think about when it comes to texture is to, uh, I mean, I mean, materials, is to remember that you have to think about the material as either, uh, first you have to question its actual shape, is, does it have a sphere underlying? Does it have a cube? Are there edges that you have to make sure are preserved in the painting process, Lars? So when you're thinking about any object um, at hand, you have to ask yourself, is it a sphere or is it a, a cube or is it some sort of polygon? And um, once you determine its basic shape, keep that basic shape in your mind projected onto the shape in front of you as you render it. So you don't forget the most essential shadows. That's number one, all right? So write that down. What's the core shape? The core shape will help you deter to determine where to place the core shadows. And you can't find core shadows unless you have a, a light source. Um, so when it comes to this book here, so this is the most rendered, it's probably one of the most rendered ones over here. Um, whoopsie. No, not scrubby zoom. All right, so let's take a look at this. The core shape in this is what? Can anyone pinpoint this uh, Deadpool book of knowledge to me? What's the basic shape underlying this? <clears throat> Let me just lasso this out to make my life a little easier. All right, rectangular prism, mm -hmm. cube. Essentially, I'm just looking for cube. All right, where's the light source? Do you guys, do, does anyone have a, a guess of where the light source is coming from? Can anyone see where the light source is coming from? Is there a light source? Top right. That's the closest thing that we can have right now, top right, because of the light that's on the top. Do you guys see any core shadows? No, Lars, you can't answer. You, you, you have a tape over your mouth. You're, you're hostage here. This is your critique. Any core shadows? No, I'm seeing lots of no's. Yeah, on the front. Hmm, I don't really see it. From the bookmarks. Yeah, a little bit on the bookmark. So what we're seeing here is we are seeing a confused kind of light source situation. If the light source was coming in from this direction over here, we would have cast shadows off these belts. We would have uh, sharper cast shadows on these little papers that are coming out. We would have um, the leather or the material or the binding would have would, would really be exposed in the in the lit areas here. So we would be needing some shadows or textures or some sort of um, material that represents what would be used for a book. Um, and after you sort of determine where the light source is coming from, it comes, becomes really easy to, 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 to pinpoint where the light source is if you respond to it according to the cube. So that, what that means essentially is that if we're having this much of a hard time trying to find where the light source is, you're not thinking of a light source environment. Um, after that, uh, I have to question what kind of material is it that you're talking about if these are material studies. Um, is it a leather material? Is it some sort of uh, wooden material used for the book? Is it metallic? Um, after that, you sort of can really uh, start to treat it like a material study instead of just a basic cube study. Also, you've got a mix of leather and you've got a mix of metallic. And so metallic, you're, treat, you're painting the metallic surface um, in response to a light source that's coming from the top this way and the book is coming, responding from a light source this way. So the best thing to do in this case is to first get a good control over the cube. That's the most important thing right now. And get that clash in there. Separate those two. After you've separated these two, the same cast shadow needs to be cast on the metallic surface. What I've said about metallic surfaces is they're still, they still have core shadows. But these core shadows that they have can be interrupted by reflectivity. And I have a whole video on that for those who are not sure. Also, depending on the kind of material, leather usually stays pretty saturated in its shadow. So I'm bringing in a saturation um, into the shadow here. 
but I'm still trying to keep this area generally generally darker. Also, this bit, unless there was like some sort of smoke, this bit is too dark, if, if we're talking about paper. And then we have to start thinking about the leather itself. So, you either respond to the light source by stippling in some sort of uneven leather surface, treating it like a mattified suede surface. So sometimes suede and leather are really similar when it comes to book binding. If you ever actually looked at a book, they become very furry and oily with age. And so we're going to have reflective points on top of the actual book. First, let me take care of the reflective surfaces on this metallic here. These little jeweled areas. So only the high points really get the illumination. And this way you're making sure that you're preserving your core shadow. You're not going to light up this whole area. This area is in shadow. I feel like the light is best when it's being cast this way. And then you have the secondary light source clashing this way. For here, what you had before was you had a secondary light source, and then you had the primary light source both sharing the same side. So I'm just trying to show how some of these jewels are still catching the light because they are reflective. And then we've got the secondary light source bringing in the illumination. There's also the fact that the surrounding area, whenever you do materials, Lars, the surrounding, right now, yes, it's floating in thin air, but you still have to bring in that color that is around this object. That color still has to be there, meaning this gray, dark, blackish color, this, this uh, charcoal color, should still be still be brought in into the edges. Our eyes like to make shortcuts and blend edges together color-wise. Once you have a really good shadow, the core, the, the secondary light source can be brought in and then it can really pop. And this way you have a really solid cube happening now. The secondary light source is an interruption of the primary light source. Let's say there was a candle nearby and it starts illuminating areas that the core shadow can't reach. So that was your biggest problem in this case. You're trying material studies, but the core of material studies, the whole point of material studies, is to not forget the basic cube. That's the test. The test isn't in the be being able to render the materials. The test is in being able to preserve the form, to still look like it has dimension and it exists in a three-dimensional world. That's the test of a form study. We're going to have some secondary light source um, reflecting there. So what did I just say? Can anyone summarize what I just said? What's your responsibility in your in your material studies? What's the biggest difficulty? Don't forget the cube. Yes, that's that's the mantra. But what essentially am I saying about the cube? It's about the form, not the rendering. Keep the form. The shape is integral. Material studies are all about cubes. The cube is life. <laughs> um, so basically, yeah, you have to remember that no matter the kind of uh, surface area that you're dealing with, you're still wrapped around a z-axis. And if you skip the actual essential, um, you know, s signifiers of that form, meaning the cube edge, cast shadows, harsh edges that aren't being blended with each other, such as this right here, if you if you miss out on these areas, what will happen is the material will not carry the read. The texture, Lars, will not carry the form. It will look flat still, and that's the, my diagnosis for all your images here. They all look flat. And this is because you're doing the material studies, and you're doing them very well, but you're thinking the material will carry the image for you. It will not. After I have the basic form, I'm going to start thinking about the material. Now I think about the material. So leather is reflective, and I'm starting to think that some of this leather has caught some of the light in the air and is reflecting it. The leather here is also reflective, so I'm going to have some kind of light mirror, kind of, not soft light, let's try a uh, color dodge. We're going to have some sort of mirrored, some kind of luminosity on the top of the book that I'll erase away. As I need it. 
So after I get the cube, I can bring in the 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 pointers of the of the of the texture or the, or the material that I have to that I'm responsible for. But I cannot wrap any material around empty space. The material material wraps around a form. So you see, the book reads a lot better to me now. This Deadpool book of knowledge, the Alpha and the Omega of Deadpool. <laughs> also. Same thing around this area. This the secondary light source might reflect on the sides of the book. So the papers of the book are not, they're pretty mattified and they're pretty broken, but they will still have some sort of reflectivity pattern happening on them. So texture again, as you can see, is not just about uh, it's not just about reflective points. It's not just about patterns. It's not just about uh, you know stippling your brush in the right way. It's determining the actual kinds of habits that 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 uh, that texture has around an object of, around a cube. If suede is wrapped around a cube, will that suede really have texture in its shadowed areas? No, it will still be mattified. But if it's in the light, you can see how if you have a suede couch, if you mess around with the suede suede couch with your hands a little bit, it will develop a pattern. So that pattern is what reflects the suede uh, characteristics the best. So that way, it can read quickly. What you want is a quick read and quick form. That will read really quickly and the person will respond to it very fast. They'll say, oh wow, that looks realistic, I like this. This happens when you treat the form first and then you treat the texture according to how it behaves both in light and in shadow. So leather isn't really that reflective in its shadowed areas, but it is pretty reflective in its lit areas, same with suede. And this is exactly how you're supposed to approach every single painting and any kind of material just like this. So before, after. At this point we really have material on the side binding here. We have material on the front, some kind of reflective material. I'm still not sure of the material used for, uh, for the front cover, but I can see some sort of leather pattern here. And we've preserved the core shadow on the sides. The book is actually emerging from the shadows that it's around. That are around it. This, I feel like you used a Photoshop filter for this. Um, let us go on to another one. Um, these rocks. Okay, so what are rocks essentially? Um, there's different kinds of rocks, but the rocks that surround magma uh, are usually um, deeper in color because the, the magma is a very, very high lighty kind of kind of environment. It makes everything else around it look extremely dark because it automatically ups the contrast. So I'm literally going to bring in my burn tool on shadows and I'm going to bring that way down because I know in this kind of material there needs to be some contrast. Instantly, instantly this contrast becomes readable right away. Also, the, 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 the magma itself doesn't really, it is one big light source because it's just a bunch of material but it does have its own light and dark areas. Let me get midtones on. So it does have areas that are both light and dark and it's got hot spots. The hotter they are, the lighter they are. The cooler they are, the darker they are. These lava, is it magma only if it's under the crust? I'm not sure. Also, you've got this light source here that you've treated, this material that you've treated as a, you haven't treated as a light source. That is a light source. Magma is fire. Magma ha has its own illumination. It will illuminate edges of the cubes around it. Yet you have this singular light source coming from the top somewhere. Any sides of this cube over here will be illuminated because of this magma. And nothing else will really be responsible for that illumination other than the magma itself. So I'm just trying to find the sides of where these, um, where the crack is. And so at this point, illumination is part of material. And at this point, we've responded to this material respectively. We've treated it as the light source that it is. You cannot forget these kinds of 
important rules about form and you know asking asking yourself what kind of material is this truly is it a reflective material if it is I can use this to my advantage and use this as a secondary light source or a primary light source to reveal some of the rocks surrounding this magma here and again you respond to the material by questioning its essential nature what kind of coarse shadows is it casting what kind of coarse shadows is it capable of and then the form starts to emerge also all in all you want to close off the form early so you want to cast a core shadow across the whole image and in those dark areas you bring in those illuminations that happen with magma Oopsie. And it, of course it's not just one solid color it's like it's a collage of yellows and oranges and deep deep reds so some of these yellows are definitely going to be necessary in the hottest spots of the magma just in their, their core areas just thinking about where those hot spots are and usually they're in like the, the clusters or the tangents that happen And again, look up a reference. I don't have a reference right now. I would need I would need a reference if I was working on magma. And what happens is on the edge of the magma there is always this this dark halo because that's the contrast working. And so we would still need to darken this whole area still to preserve that necessary amount of contrast to render that kind of texture. And then there is the solid fact that it is an, a light source and it is illuminating anywhere around it so it's, it's got a glow to it. And there are probably cracks around where the magma is being poured. So again that's us questioning the, the texture of the rock and the material of the rock surrounding it that's holding this other kind of material that's illuminating it. And all this helps push the believability of this texture. Questioning its, its, uh, its texture, questioning its luminosity, reflectivity, all of that. I wouldn't leave it at that. I would probably smudge it and blend away. Blend away what I don't need. It doesn't have to be a consistent line for me to believe that it's a crack in the rock. And you just do these all around just to continue the fact that the magma is pouring from this this lava, this uh, I mean this rock texture. And keep don't just leave it at that with the um, with the illuminations on the side of the rock. Try to continue the, the the at this point when you have reflection happening from this magma on this rock. You have an opportunity to bring in some cool rock textures in those lit up areas. So at this point, it goes back to pattern. What kind of patterns happen in these kinds of textures? So to add to the list, there's patterns that are caused by light. So in lit areas, material behaves very differently than in shadowed areas. And that's something that you really have to think about for us to believe that this is really a rock with some magma coming on it, on it or off of it or, out, or in, from inside it or what have you. Oops, it looks like a face. Alright, so remember that establishing your core shadow helps you find a good foundation to wrap the texture around. Next would be to ask yourself what kind of texture is it? Is it a reflective texture? Is it, um, is it an actual element? So is it fire? Is it water? Is it earth? Um, so, sounds so cryptic. <clears throat> and after you determine it, is it affecting its surrounding environment? So is there going to be a, a really great amount of diffuse happening in the shadows, in the core shadows? If there is, how do you respond to it best? By preserving the form as well as bringing in shadow. So to preserve the form, 
we make sure that the shadowed areas remain untextured and lit areas remain textured. So as you see, there's a lot of negative space and a lot of positive space. And all the positive space, like this and this, is being caused by a light source. And that's, that's us taking advantage of the fact that the lit areas are where we can start placing in some texture and material. And this feels more alive and more responsive and feels like it has an actual light environment. So material is a massive scope to, to, to study through because you're going to deal with every possible situation. It's a really, really tricky little way of learning how to render because you can easily come up with a specific kind of way to draw and then you'll stick to that way and that way won't necessarily work for every kind of material. So always remember the cube because the cube is the consistent thing that will never change. The cube is that z-axis that you always have to ask yourself about. Is it? What kind of object is it? So before, after, before, after. Now it has a light environment. Before it looked like some uh, slushy was poured onto some rock on the beach. Like it didn't feel like magma. And after we sort of treat it like a light source, we have hot spots. We're thinking about the physics of it. We're thinking about the sides of the, of the rocks that are being illuminated. We're treating the, the magma as a light source. And this way we have an actual light environment and it feels more believable. Um, where else do we have something like this? Okay, let's go, let's go on to glass. Glass is see-through. And it's only visible when an agent is used to make it visible. So it's an, it's an invisible thing, just like pretty much water. But it needs something, some sort of texture disturbance in order for us to see it. So... Um, the kind of glass used in those fancy glasses, those, uh, those, I don't know what kind of glasses they're called, I think they're whiskey glasses, they're all like rippled and, and designed well. Those kinds of glasses are really easy to see. They're not completely invisible because they have ripples and breaks in their surface texture, therefore they're no longer smooth. And the light can't travel over them very evenly as in a mirror. So what you do when you want to draw some kind of water texture, I mean some kind of anything that's, that's see-through, draw the substance, substance that's in it first. Sorry about my cat, she's howling. She's in her time of the month. So I'm just trying to get a good shape for the glass. And right now you're outlining pretty much Lars, so you don't need this dark line, what you need is that light line. After you determine that, you don't need that, um, that film. All you need are the areas around the glass that are actually getting the illumination on them. So probably on the edge of the glass, you would need some, side of, some sort of indication that, that this is the edge of the glass and that's where the texture is sharpest, probably rippled or when it was made, it was probably thicker on the outside than the inside. You do not paint in this area, because this area is see-through, unless this is a pink glass. If it's not a pink glass, you don't paint over it. This is a see-through substance. What happens is it has hot spots that light the light reaches. See? And those areas are pretty much what reveal the glass to us in this empty space. So look up any glass refer or any glass picture. Um, glass of wine. You'll see that it has that it reflects the background better. This kind of glass reflects the background um, here as well. Only the edges really get some indication, but right through the object, right through the middle, there's no, it's a, it's a, there's less atmosphere, I guess, between, of the glass between you and the background. So the background color takes over. There's very, very little dimming of the background color. So a glass of wine in a dark room. Let's look at these. This is the situation you were, this was the particular situation you were drawing. 
the background color is completely taking over and all we have are the edges because that's the kind of material we're dealing with. It's a transparent material. So there's another question to ask yourself. What kind of, is it an opaque material or is it a, a see-through material? Is it transparent? And pretty much only the light and, and the actual wine itself are revealing the glass. The glass doesn't have any substantial texture of its own catching the light. Only the reflectivity here is capturing that mirror-like surface of the glass. And that's what you need to do here. Just determine the kind of color it is, first of all. I'm just throwing in this pink because that's the closest color. And then you have to start treating the glass in its texture environment. So what kind of reflections does this glass cause? Let me zoom out. And it's already starting to look more like glass because we're, we're thinking about the light environment. So I'm going to erase away some of these. I'm sorry about the mess. I can't really do a perfect job. And there's going to be areas that are more dim than others. It's not going to be completely opaque in reflection. And then you have the halo on the outsides of the cup. Just on the outsides here and here. Because that's what I'm seeing from my reference. I'm seeing that there is a, a sort of cluster of, of the glass texture right on the edges because that's where it wraps around again. But when it's just two in front of each other there isn't much texture. There's more mileage of texture on the edges of the glass. That's why we have that, that sort of halo on the very edge. The light is clustered there and causes um, an op a more opaque reflection. And then, um, this is where I place that. I'm just going to bring down that transparency. And then, ask yourself again, if this is a see-through texture, is the water, is the actual substance inside reaching the edges completely? I don't think it would. We would have a sort of a limit right at the edge before the water actually sits inside the cup, just like this. Because again, this is a see-through material. It's see-through. It's going to take, there's going to be areas that are see-through but too dense for the water to sit in, the non-hollowed out areas. So material is a very, very big thing to take on, Lars. It's not it's not easy. All you have to do is, is just approach it as a scientific observation. Ask yourself, what kind of material is it? What kind of textures am I dealing with? What kind of reflectivity am I dealing with? And you'll have something that reads much quicker. This cup, however messily done, I'm sorry, reads much quicker than this cup which is kind of seems like it's made out of um, wax paper cup that's what I'm seeing if I were to really take this seriously and ask if this is real. It's like a wax paper cup with um, NyQuil put in some water. So, so it is a cup. Like it can be, this can be in real life, but, but the problem is that you're trying for a cup and you're using all the wrong signifiers of glass. Um, what else do you have here? Um, these three that I saw before, you're pretty much just changing the color and dealing with the color in that light situation. Um, you're not trying the way that other other muscles might be illuminated in this in this uh, in this light situation. You're pretty much just changing the colors. So what I recommend in treating this leather costume or this spandex or whatever it's called is change the light source direction. So if you really want to just embed in your mind a really good study of spandex, try a light source that's coming from this way this way and this way and try to challenge yourself to see which parts of the cube you're capturing that you're, you need to capture in that light source and then respond to it. Leather is very difficult and spandex is very difficult. It's a really great way to test your knowledge of the core shadow, test your knowledge of texture and reflectivity and test your knowledge of the cube. Oh no, my history stats. Just one second. References, general. Oh, see, shut up. Shush. All right.
So that's what I have about that. Um, this chocolate, I uh, think you're, you're raising the value. One big thing to worry about when it comes to texture is to not raise the value too high. If you want to shade bark or if you want to shade a leaf, sometimes there's only so high you can go in shading that leaf and choosing a highlighter for that leaf. Before, there's only so high you can go before it starts to look like that leaf is actually pigmented. So here, yes, this is a highlight, but you've, you've, you've raised the value so high it no longer feels like a highlight. It feels like there's a little bit of, especially because of this strange texture you have here, it feels like someone sprinkled some powder on this chocolate instead of that's the chocolate's natural reflective pattern. So you need to bring this value all the way down again and maintain its mattified surface. I'm not sure the reference you used, but um, I'm going to try to guess my way around which areas are reflective. So basically the bulges of the chocolate are what are going to get the, the highlight or the little bit of highlight. Just the very bulges of it. If there are larger pieces that are casting some shadows. So be careful. That's another thing to add. Be careful with the value. If you are shading any kind of material, and you choose the highlighter or highlight color on top of the base tone, you choose the highlighter tone, make sure that highlighter tone is not too far a deviation from where this texture is or this material is on the color wheel. If you go too high, it will look like an actual pigmentation issue. I'm bringing in the background color and bleeding it over. You always need to remember to bring in the background color. Back colors bleed together all the time. And you had some sort of furry texture happening. Uh, when it comes to certain kinds of materials, you cannot have a furry texture or a furry edge. Sometimes a really solid edge is needed. Where else is this needed? Um, right over here on this rock. You're having these really, really tapered off edges. Be careful of that because the rocks don't do that. And so if you throw that in there, along with whatever else that's reading, you will give off an, the wrong impression about the kind of material, material you're trying to render. You, some areas you just have to have a really, really clean cut edge that does not mix with the background. And about this rock, um, again, you need to treat it like a polygon, just like the form studies that I tell you guys to do all the time. You need to make sure that there is one, one area of that surface that is lit up and one area that is not. I'm not sure why this is green. I'm just going to throw a color fix over it so that it matches. It's too green. It was raised too high. And select inverse and everything else here will either adapt the background color and get that darkness to it. And this area here. We'll get that shadow. And it needs to be a cleaner edge, Lars. You need to have those clean edges or else you'll not be able to differ differentiate these, um, these surface areas from each other. And this would be like another sort of addition to that rock shape, just like this. Of course, it would not be this smooth. There would be breaks in this rock surface, just like this. Um, there would be areas of the rock that are illuminated under the light, just like that. Um, there's all kinds of, of little interruptions on the smoothness of these surfaces, so you have to be aware of those and entertain them as they come. So the side of this rock here will get a little bit of illumination, but look look I'm, what I'm doing right now. I'm throwing a, a, a side that's lit up in a core shadow side, so this means I can't go this light or this light. I have to go really dark to make sure that I'm preserving the, 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 
the core shadow. Wait a second, what did I do? Lasso. Right. Yeah, to preserve the fact that the core shadow environment is a dark environment. So I'm not acting like there's pigmentation. If I make it go this light, it feels like the pigmentation is different in that area. There's a lot of rules to think about when it comes to materials because you, at this point you start to become a physicist and you start starting to think about the actual physics of the whole thing. That's pretty much what you need to think about, Lars, is all of that stuff. Please make sure that the edges are not um, furry where they can't be physically. Sometimes edges are going to be extremely, extremely sharp because that's the only way that material works. If you think about its density, its atomic density, it's, it's whatever it is that it's made of. Sometimes the only way it works is if it is that dark. Same with these tiny little dark rocks here. They have edges in the cube areas here that are, that are going to be dark and you have to preserve those shadows. So there's pretty much one consistent theme whenever I teach, and it's about the cube. The cube guides you into placing where the shadows, where you place shadows, and what is rendering if not knowing where to place your shadows and where to place your lights. That's what rendering is all about. When you render something, you, you bring it to life by, by responding to a light source. Sorry about my soft brush, it's really taking away from, from this. Same thing with this, this kind of gem. Gems have actual surfaces that you cannot interrupt with like, um, let me see if I can, because they all connect to each other. They're like cut in a way where they're connected to each other. So this would connect to this here. but it would be at a lighter version because this angle, the angle of this surface is facing a different direction. And then in all gems you sort of have this one one spot that's really hot but because it's facing the light source directly. Something like that. And it preserves some of the light source color in it. So if, there, if the light source is yellow, we're going to have an almost white reflection on that part of the gem. Of course, we still need to preserve the color because if something is colored, it's going to throw back its color and its reflection. It's probably going to have little pieces on the side of it right there that aren't as illuminated. So there's another thing to think about. Sometimes you can't just throw in a pattern and expect it to read. Sometimes you really have to go in there and paint every side of that cube. And that's the only way it'll really start to read as that specific material. You see, this will not read if I go in and just throw any random polygon texture. It will not read as the gem that it is. Another thing to think about is sharpness in material. Sometimes material, it needs that sharpness level that your brushes on Photoshop can't do. Really, really clean edges. So what I'm going to do is just literally get the sharpen tool a sharp one of the sharpen tools on Photoshop and just sharpen uh, it's going to be sh um, unsharp mask and I'm just using that on the most lit up edge and like every surface area that's lit up it's going to have only one hot spot within it so that's probably going to be the top of that little triangle I drew like the top part of it, the topmost part of it is going to get the most illumination. And then you've got the fact that this is also one big see-through object. So how does the how do the edges look? Are they all really spherical like that? Or do they have should you follow a, a more broken, less circular kind of cut? Something like um, an octagon have where you see the actual cuts on the surface areas that that you're seeing in three-quarter view okay so 
So I'm just going to do something like this. You can you can make it a different shape. And in those very edges, there's going to be again more more of that reflection. So if there's areas here that have surface areas that are facing the light sources or secondary light sources surrounding it, they're going to be lit up. So this edge here would have its own little side. This edge here would have would be responding to another light source. This edge here might be responding to a secondary light source nearby. And you see now we're starting to see a cube emerge. And yeah, it's not an actual box. We're not seeing boxes. When I say cube, I mean there is three-dimensional z-axis has been considered. And this reads better instantly because we've invested the z-axis in there in our rendering of it. I don't want it to be too light, so again, I'm going to bring in the background color, just sh fade that away. I want to preserve the fact that this is the lit up area of that gem. And your gem, when you draw it, actually just find the actual shape. Go in there and just choose a crazy shape for that gem, whatever it may be. And in creating that shape, find where the lit areas are and where they aren't. That way you'll know if in the light, the areas that are lit, how to treat that texture, and in the areas that are shadowed, how to treat that texture. Materials act differently in light source and in shadow. And some materials you cannot render in their shadows. So where are these areas here? You cannot render rock too much in its shadowed areas. You can't render... Um, uh, areas that aren't naturally reflective. So let's look at the uh, uh, wait the the mattified areas. So skeleton. You cannot add too much detail in the skeletal area. Here you've made a mistake. There's a lot of detail here and not a lot of detail here. We will have more contrast in lit areas because the shadows will be sharper. So if you were to create create a crack in this area, it would be a darker color used for that crack in the skull. So remember, not always is there going to be detail in the shadowed areas when it comes to material. Always ask yourself, what kind of material is this? Can it entertain lots of detail in its shadowed areas? Meaning, is it, is it really reflective? Is it transparent? This area can because it's, the light is traveling from within. This is not an opaque. This is not opaque. This is transparent. So the light will th dance around inside it, revealing the shadowed areas. You don't see much of a core shadow, do you? Because it's a transparent gem. But here it's not transparent, it's opaque. There isn't light dancing through this material. So there's going to be very little opportunity for contrast. So bring that down, dim it down, and focus all the detail, attention on the areas that are actually lit. So all this texture, preserve it for this lit area. And finally, when it comes to metallic surfaces like armor, I've covered this in one of my videos, and the basis of the video was that when you do reflective stuff like armor, capture the core shadow first. Where is the core shadow sitting mostly on this object? And after you get that basic shadow going, after you get like the, the, the necessary amount of darkness in that room, so this looks like a pretty dark room, then you can bring in the, the, the breaks in that. So there's going to be one big break right on, along the side. Probably on the very edge. Depending on where the light source is. <clears throat> Hot spots in the reflectivity. areas that are just purely lit because they're facing like a mirror toward the light source. This area here would get that light color on it because this is part of the cube that's facing forward. And this is the part of the cube that's facing backward away from the light. And it will need a lot of edge work. Sometimes reflective surfaces need lots and lots of edge work, meaning you cannot taper off on reflective surfaces. Metallic surfaces are most mostly opaque. 
meaning they don't ha you don't have much space for tapering and depending on tapering. And I've noticed, Lars, that you taper as a crutch. Sometimes you don't have harsh edges because you you might fear them, you might have an issue with them. So be careful with that. The top of this little eyebrow piece would have some light on it because that's the reflective material catching the light on that top side. Not the bottom of it. You place it on the bottom. So if this critique was a checkpoint on your sort of understanding of light, you need to start, and this is the biggest diagnosis, you need to start creating light environments. And light environments cannot be established if you don't have a light direction everything is following. You have to choose where the light source is coming from. This is reflecting onto this. And then I have to treat this area. I'm going to just get the dodge tool. <clears throat> Oops. It's going to have one big consistent secondary light source reflection on it. Not as light as the other areas though. And this one will have vertical ones because it's again facing some sort of point in the distance. And I'm just going to keep darkening and making sure the hot spots are the only in the areas that are lit up by the light. So this, these areas that can be lit up by the light are the areas facing the light directly. And um, as for the actual design of this material, so that's why I'm a bit confused where to place the light. It seems like you have these edges, so your edge work definitely needs help. These edges that need to be pushed in in order for me to believe that this, is as, this edge on the three-quarter view is the same as what you're representing on the other side. So that's what I mean here. You didn't have this kind of edge. And um, if this is on the back of the helmet, these pieces here would not show. These are on the back hiding behind that mohawk. So you don't think about the cube enough, Lars. If you thought about the cube, you'd realize the other side of this cube is where this is all sitting. The cube is a very, very complicated thing to think about. It's not easy to wrap your head around rotation and to imagine rotation in your ref in your image to actually see the image rotate in your mind that's the challenge <clears throat> just like the gem that we drew there are going to be areas that are lit up because they face and mirror the actual direction the light is traveling in that area so it might be a secondary light source it might be might be some sort of object casting a secondary light source or it could be a bounce light source. And preserve your, your symmetry as well. Um, again, here with hair, I've talked about hair a lot and all I can say is please get the core shadow. Hair has reflective hot spots that travel around just like this and, and wrap around the, the hair. And that's the only way we can really read the texture is if you have the texture behaving with the light the way it's supposed to. If it doesn't, it feels mattified. It feels like she put a bunch of powder on her head before. And you see the contrast and the sharpness is heightened where there is highlights. And where there isn't any highlights, there is no contrast. Why? Because hair is not transparent. It's opaque. Clustered together, it would be one big solid object. Yeah, it can spread apart because it's, it's a bunch of little strands, but essentially it's a bunch of, of small opaque objects. And then invest the background into the, 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 the edges. That way you have an object that behaves with its light, light situation. 
both in the light source and in the colors bouncing around in that light source, meaning the background color will affect the skin tone. And you've got cast shadows that are absolutely necessary. So sharp spots here on the nose, leading down here over the eyeball. Some of that area will be cast that way. Okay. So what have we learned today? Um, certain materials cast their own light, so they, they throw off light affecting the objects around them. In doing that, they up the contrast. So the contrast is instantly heightened, therefore we realize that this material cannot exist unless it has high contrast. Um, we've learned that you cannot have certain kinds of detail um, uh, you can't have detail in areas that are shadowed for certain materials, especially opaque materials. You have to be transparent in order to have um, uh, detail in your, in your shadowed areas because the, the reflection brings in detail with it from the light. So in order to have light, in order to have detail, you have to have light. If there is no light touching a certain part of a material, you cannot detail that. If you detail it, it will look weird. Uh, yes, these boots are amazing. Um, I'm going to talk about the ones that I really like. I feel like you captured them very, very well. Um, this one here I feel like is captured very well. I really like this one because you captured that haze properly. I do recommend, though, to bring in some reflection on the, the, the area that is being lit up. So there's areas here that are, that are catching some light. This light affects everything that touches it. It's not just the, it's not just the metal. And there might be more metal on the side. Oopsie. Oops. There might be, I mean, more um, more reflection on the side here, and uh, more on the side there it's reflective in all its areas. It's not just one area that's getting some reflection. Everywhere there is going to be an opportunity for that reflective material to reflect something on it. So basically reflective materials and metallic materials are um, a mirror, a, a mirror that, a blanket made out of a mirror that's wrapped around the cube. So it's going to reflect everything. It might be a really dirty mirror, but it's still a mirror. So you have to think about the areas that are surrounding it. So if these boots were beside this piece of armor, this 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 boot, both in color and in, and in form, are going to be reflected on the side. So these boots are going to reflect their color right here along the side of this. So this is a mirror. Again, just a really dirty mirror wrapped around the cube. So think of the material as the as the skin on top of the cube, but you first have to have the cube because you won't be able to wrap anything around anything unless you know where the edges are. <clears throat> and you didn't have much edge work. That's pretty much the only thing I recommend. Everything else with your brushes, like the way you did the um, you did the, uh, the ice, this ice skull, the way you did the wood here, might be a little bit clean for wood. You might want to up the detail on that because there's a lot of detail in between each panels of the wood, so you need to respond to that detail level everywhere. Um, the way you did the wood, like it actually feels like wood, like the, the horizontal grain that happens with wood, that, that or those horizontal lines, good job on that. With these flasks here, like unless there's like a smoke inside, you don't really need the edges. This one, because it's being reflected off the other, so you probably want a really thin layer of the background color. And then you'll have the color of the glass reflecting on the side. But that would be pretty much it. So remember the fact that the back background plays a big role in these objects. The side of the Iron Man helmet would be reflecting some, some light as well. Select inverse. 
this side over here. Yes, this is the part of the cube that is not lit up, so it can't be as bright as these areas. But it still needs its own reflection and consideration of any diffused light coming from the side. Um, this shield, the shield probably has a high point on it, so that somewhere in the middle the shield has like a bulge, like a symmetri symmetrical bulge right around the, the middle. That area should be mostly shadowed, just like this. And it would be darker right along the middle, so it wouldn't be everywhere that it's shadowed, just along the middle area, and everything would have to respond to that. But you would still get, um, you would still get some areas that are catching some light. So these parts of the shield will have like a nice pattern to them. The parts of the of the of the horse or the griffin would go up and interrupt that horizontal line completely because that's the, the those are that's the grain. Be careful of using Photoshop filters. They will give you um, an over rendered look that you won't be able to achieve anywhere else on the painting. So if you had like a girl holding this lollipop and you rendered this girl like crazy as much as you could possibly render you will never reach this level of rendering because Photoshop did this that good it knows exactly how to build down the darkest tones so you have intense detail here and if you wanted this girl to be the focal point she would never be the focal point it would be this lollipop so be careful of using pre-made textures be careful of bringing in material from other um, websites if you want to paint material, do not use too much overlay of other textures because it will look very fake compared to what you're capable of with your hands, with your naked hands um, on your own. And it will look very, very fake. So again, core shadow, core shadow, um, not really core shadow, core shadow, core shadow core shadow but surface area reflection so transparency 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 uh, core shadow tra uh, core shadow not transparency so opaqueness core light so basically making sure that there both a mix of core shadow and uh, and reflectivity I'm not really sure what these are um, this try experimenting the sides of the muscles so think of the muscle as a cube so let's say this is the uh, trapezius muscle. Think of the muscle as like an actual stake that you cut out. So yeah, this light situation right now is revealing this part of the stake, but how about this part right here? When you transfer the light to be on this side, it will reveal this part of the spandex. So try to experiment by having the light coming from a different layer, or a different angle, I mean, sorry. Um, edges, please make sure that you keep your edges so you had an edge problem here. You had an edge problem here, you had an edge problem here, um, you had an edge problem here, um, an edge problem here. Make sure that this is not blended and over blended. Um, you had an edge problem here, make sure you don't taper off, don't taper off, you tapered off here and here. Um, and that's it, just keep all of that stuff in mind and you will, you will be on an efficient way, you'll, you'll be on a road that is the most, that will promise the most efficient learning. And you will start to pick up patterns and rules that are consistent throughout any material that you do. So the first rule you've learned today is the cube is consistent no matter what you're drawing. Imagine the cube again, the material as a, you know, give me any object, throw any object at me right now. Um, let me just, let's see, a um, uh, rolling pin. So the rolling pin's core shape is a butt. No, no, it's okay, I found an object in my head. The rolling pin's core shape are just three cylinders. Okay? So where is the cube in the cylinder is the biggest question you have to ask yourself. Where is the cube in this cylinder? Well, we have the x-axis and we have the y-axis. The cube in this cylinder is right here. This z-axis that cuts into the distance. It says this, this, this rolling pin is sitting on a table and is moving back towards the table. So this line right here with this line and this line is the z-axis. So as soon as you find the cube, you'll know where to throw the light. If the light is coming here, 
you'll know that the z-axis is traveling al along this way. And so if any light comes in, it'll wrap around, but it'll have a limit. And that limit is determined by where that z-axis tells us this object started to move away from the light and wrap around. The light cannot wrap. Light just goes in straight lines. And so the fact that we know where this edge is and the light is coming from here, we can cast shadows pretty good as well. So we can cast a shadow off this rolling pin. And after we get all of this said and done, we can bring in the, the texture like they do in 3D modeling. You can just wrap it around. It's called unwrapping or something. And you can just wrap this texture on. So it would be a wood grain texture. It wouldn't be very detailed in the darks area, so make sure this is not as detailed. This is very detailed. And the wood grain texture has a pattern that travels horizontally until it slowly starts to taper off in the shadowed areas. And this goes here, and this goes here. That's how you think about material. That's the process. But the first thing is where is the Z axis, all right? The Z axis, where is it? If you find that, you can fill in all the blanks. Damn you, Photoshop. <clears throat> Um, don't hate me on math. Don't hate on math. Math loves you. <laughs> when I die and go to hell, math will be waiting for me. <laughs> um, to help find the axis cube. A few math. It's not really about math. <laughs> it's just like that's how you have to think if you're an artist. You have to think about the way this object sits in open space. If you think about open space, light sits and travels around open space. We can't have light in a 2D world. It just would not make sense. How would it travel? We'd have to get out of its way so that it can keep going. But because this is a 3D world, light can wrap around. And so it can bypass the fact that we are 3D objects. And it's a 3D object, and it wraps around, revealing everything with it. Um, this is a lot of stuff that I've covered today. So I might have sounded like I was talking to myself. But um, I hope that you sort of understand what I was, what I was getting at. Is that it's all about really just learning about the space, thinking about the space and creating a light environment in that space. Um, light environments are everything. When you're painting a picture, look at the most amazing masterpiece you've ever seen and see it not as a painting of a human being, but see it as a light environment. The best thing that I learned out of Alla Prima um, is the fact that everything should be treated as a light environment. Everything is just light. That's all it really is. A, a, the a table leg is not a table leg. It's light revealing a texture and has an edge. The form is there, yes, traveling with the light and helping the light wrap around, not really wrap around it, but reveal it. But nonetheless, it's all about light. Light determines color and saturation and reflectivity. The reason why we see all of these objects, this array of objects here, is because of light behavior. If you create a light environment, thinking about where the cube is, casting appropriate shadows and reflective shadows and diffuse, diffuse light, um, dif reflective light and diffuse light, sorry, the object will, will, will live in its own 3D space. And is that not what we want to do? We want to make something look realistic. Realistic equals 3D. And that's it. <clears throat> what materials, when exposed to light or light environment, have color variations? Um, sometimes leather has this. Skin has this, David. Skin has a different behavior in light in certain areas. Sometimes um, skin is more red in the shadows. Sometimes it's more red in the light, depending on the kind of um, light it is. Subsurface scattering is the object see-through. So when you look at your ear, light travels through your ear. That whole area, that whole ear is a silhouette and an illumination at the same time. That's what subsurface scattering is so weird, because you have both a silhouette and you have the object being illuminated at the same time. So it has to be a deeper value. So if I'm painting, I'm going to like, okay, the ear has to be a certain level of darkness in order for this to make sense. I can't make the ear white light. You know, that kind of make it that light. Um, I have to make it dark enough so that it seems like the light is behind it, causing the subsurface scattering. But I also have to bring in a lot of saturation. So material, the skin material, um, the material of skin changes color a lot and has a great variance of color in it when light travels through. Anyways, have a great week, you guys. Bye-bye.